Hello everyone, my name is Sebastian. I work for Deutsche Telekom Engineering and I'm an architect there in the International Network Infrastructure Unit responsible for voice, programmable telecoms, cloud and innovation. And this is a short piece on uh, serverless for telecoms as part of the TED Summit 2020 panel with the same name. Um, I'd like to kick off not really defining serverless. Um, for serverless, we do need servers. Maybe that's a kind of short statement as an intro. There's always going to be hardware. Uh, we'll just uh, differ a bit in the level of abstraction um, and of um, dedicated resource assignment and so on. And of the things we can actually run there, which has, of course, an impact on telecoms. Um, but I find it much more interesting to actually define telecoms when it comes to discussing serverless and by that, somehow the evolution of the um, layer providing actually the base for executing um, our software. So what I'd like to do is in the definition of telecoms cluster it a bit um, into things where we as telco act as core service providers. Um, that is mainly uh, telephony, signaling, and somehow everything that has a legacy stack attached to it. Um, so rather, you know, complex telco protocols, SIP, RTP, SIGTRAN, all these kind of things. Um, the second thing I want to um, uh, look at are um, all remaining services that telcos offers, but that are not strictly within the domain, classic domain of, um, of, of telecoms. So you could think of powering your Hello Magenta speaker with the equivalent of Alexa skills. Um, you could think of enabling the EPG um, the electronic program guide or an IPTV platform, or also classic web services such as billing, provisioning, or some fulfillment handling, right? So that's like the IT stack on the telecom side. That's the second cluster. Um, I like to focus on the first one, really, on telecommunication services. And in there, um, I would like to split it again in two kind of um, categories. The first one is um, core communication features, um, as mentioned earlier somewhat always um, related to real-time communication, so connecting various entities using legacy telco protocols and also handling the media stream between them. Um, the second part is programmable telecoms, um, also often summarized under the term communications platform as a service or CPaaS. So that's kind of everything um, where you would interact with an uh, RESTful API layer. Uh, you have a platform, a communications platform in between your legacy systems that exposes APIs, um, but underlying, of course, is um, also a classic, let's say, telco stack connector. Um, and when focusing on the latter category, um, we're looking at the API layer, right? Which means um, interacting with the APIs or building new functionalities on top of CPaaS, not really connecting it to the telco core network. Um, Looking a bit backwards, um, I think we have very different um, use cases and evolution paths towards serverless. Um, um, by that, I already kind of imply one thing or one basic main view um, that I have on serverless, and that is that serverless for telecoms is something that happens in the future. It's not really present state. Um, that doesn't mean it's not used anywhere, but it's actually just not used in the domain where I'm active in. When we look at serverless and telecom, um, I think we have very different evolution paths um, from today towards serverless. Um, and by that, saying that, I already kind of imply one of my main um, opinions, I would say, and that is that serverless uh, in telecoms is something that is in the future and not really um, present state. Um, what I do not question is that serverless computing and executing functions, modifying HTTP requests or orchestrating various functions um, is relevant in the telecoms area, but rather in the beginning for um, non-telco services, as I categorize them in, in between. And for the so for the programmable parts, um, of course, uh, you may still use these for workloads you have already offloaded somewhere where you have also handlers and where you can put um, software on top that can be executed as a as a serverless function. But that's not really um, core communications features yet. Um, so in the category uh, one that I mentioned, co-communications, we don't have it yet. Um, in the area of um, uh, the remaining parts, the classic web services, I think we do already have them. They are very relevant there, um, but that's not really very telco specific, right? So if I have an EPG and there's a database and whenever the user clicks something, there's a small interaction 
with the database, for example. And this is handled using a serverless function. That's a very, very valid use case, but it's not really a telco specific that fits here um, in, in the discussion, in my view. Um, the other part that I mentioned besides the core telecoms um, in the communications area was CPaaS. And as I already said, I think everything um, above the legacy connect layer is of course relevant for serverless, but the same applies as, as does for the classic web services. Once you have a RESTful API, serverless becomes kind of a no-brainer. So this is also something where I don't think um, there's a critical opinion to be had or discussion to be, uh, to be done. Um, I think um, this is something that I want to leave out of the discussion. Of course, we can talk about it later in the panel, but uh, what I would like to focus on um, are more the aspects of telco that is really about um, communication. And that's on one hand core communications and also um, programmable telecoms, but with a bit of a different um, outlook as I'll highlight in the end. Um, for core communications overall, serverless, uh, we aren't there yet and we are not there yet um, by a long shot, I would say. And I'll explain also why. Um, I think when you when you look at the evolution of how carriers um, approached, let's say, infrastructure and to categorize, categorize serverless as infrastructure slash platform features, um, the classic evolution path is um, that I have in mind or when I would take it, um, when I took it down here for the, for the meeting preparation was kind of, uh, first we had bare metal, then we had virtual machines. After that, we had um, containers, container orchestration, Kubernetes is now um, quite the hip topic. And in the end, eventually there comes um, serverless abstracting even more, right? Um, and the pattern in this, uh, in this evolution in general is basically decreasing the requirement of owning hardware, of managing hardware, of managing also constraints that come with hardware ownership, of thinking where to put your, your workload. So you're abstracting um, the layers under the software stack. Um, and in the end, you also have um, less control, but also less dependencies. It's kind of a trade-off here, right? Um, and in, what is increasing um, is the possibility also when it comes to automation um, of putting your workload um, on, the, on the infrastructure and also um, of the software stack itself that is, that is running on it, right? So it's much easier um, to, to move workloads and to scale up when you have an, an, a flexible infrastructure underlying your, uh, your software stack rather than when it's bare metal. And in order to scale up, you need to bring in another physical server, put it into the rack, configure it, um, look at the IP you give it from, from an Excel file and so on, right? Um, to give a bit of background also why I, um, um, why I maybe tend to have this bit legacy view before talking about serverless in more detail or some of the projects I'm involved at the moment. Um, we are at the moment setting up a new intercarrier voice platform on something else than uh, bare metal, which the team used to run on in the past. And on the other hand, um, I'm introducing a CPaaS platform for MVPs and for market trial. And for CPaaS, of course, um, when it comes to serverless, um, it's very relevant when you think of working the API layer. Um, but even though I have the full responsibility there and I could put everything on, on the infrastructure platform layer, I'd like to, um, I think the uh, dependencies we have when serving the legacy stack aren't yet um, there for serverless. So we have neither the software nor, nor does the um, traffic pattern and, and the, 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 the flow style kind of suit it, I think. Um, with the traffic expectations containers, whether we have it orchestrated or not, are possible. So you can receive um, in a containerized CPaaS platform forwarded calls and forwarded SMS and then trigger the API layer. Um, but that's about it, right? And since the underlying layer is just not event-driven, um, and this is what serverless is actually mostly about, in my opinion, um, um, yeah, um, we, uh, we can only act on um, events and process them as small workloads um, whenever they occur. On the software layer, we can receive hooks, we can process, we can do external queries, queries and give it back. But the layer itself, the SIP layer, the media layer, um, is nothing that I think uh, at the moment uh, it makes sense to server uh, to yeah to to um, provide serverless. Um, very good example also is the um, uh, current platform that I've integrated uh, because it has an API gateway placed in front of it. Um, and uh, for extending, enriching, augmenting, however you want to call it, the CPaaS API, 
um, with more logic, I use another component, right? Um, this is done today in an API gateway that has a smart middleware function where I can filter requests, where I can make sure users send SMS only from verified numbers and so on. Um, this can, of course, be done with a serverless function, no question about it. We've even used it here and there on AWS with, um, with some Lambda functions to test. But, um, but overall, um, as I said, that's no different to, to any other web service, right? So that's not really making it particular um, to telecoms. And coming back to the intercarrier platform setup now that I mentioned, um, and doing a reality check here, um, we really see, um, and I had to learn myself how far away um, we are from anything um, that's bare metal, really, right? Because we're now at the next step, but not really uh, much further. Um, what does that mean? Uh, well, we're looking into virtualization um, at the moment deployed in a virtualized manner um, to become hardware independent. Um, but what we are already doing a bit differently than classic carriers is to do this kind of telco virtualization, right? So we are not making a religion out of it. Um, we're not trying to fulfill all possible standards, get in the overhead that's not needed, um, uh, try to push our vendors into, um, into that. But we really say um, we want a rather, I, I would say, IT approach. Um, we have a virtualization layer, an existing infrastructure um, as a service platform inside the company that we want to run on and we want to get uh, the workload on it. We want to um, um, supplement that also with an deployment in, on, on the hyperscaler side, which is, again, not really standardized. And all of this should be automated and orchestrated. And we learn, want to learn um, doing it. We want to grow also. We want to um, kind of um, develop the, the capabilities also inside the company. Um, um, and yeah, that's, um, that's pretty much what, uh, where we are at the moment, right? So we are not yet talking containers or anything um, beyond that. Um, and I think that's very important because what I learned is that the, the previous um, evolution picture that I had in mind where I was also drawing the, you know, the responsibility stacks, bare metal, you have everything under your control that we had um, infrastructure as a service, so the, the virtual machines where we had basically um, everything below the hypervisor is kind of um, abstracted, but then you have the hypervisor, then you have your VMs, then you have platform as a service using Docker containers, the abstraction level moves up and so on and so on. Um, but I think it's um, the, the, the look we have to take at it is a bit more granular already. And that, again, has an impact on, on when I think we will eventually arrive at serverless or if we will arrive there at all. Because actually, um, after bare metal, the first layer or the first um, thought layer that comes um, is a virtual machine layer on top of our own metal. Right? That's what we would think about. So if we would say, well, virtualization, we, we know bare metal works. Uh, we don't want to, you know, um, go too far uh, out on territory. We are not really um, um, knowing that well. So we thought of putting a virtualization layer on top of our own metal. Didn't do that in the, in, in the end, which was a different approach. But, but doing that, I thought of what are other possibilities actually towards serverless. Um, and what I came up with was as a next level, what you could do, um, you could put a managed virtual machine layer um, on top of a dedicated internally owned metal. Um, that's more what we do now. So um, another unit provides us the infrastructure layer. Um, they provide us the virtualization layer um, and we can directly one-on-one -on -one discuss requirements. Um, but we have a dedicated um, hardware layer there that we know um, is ours. So essentially we save a bit on the virtualization layer, but the hardware, our thinking when it comes to hardware, when it comes to dedicated resources for the software workload didn't change. Um, a next step could be to have this provided externally um, but only when we discuss the hyperscaler integration on our side, actually there we see that with a hyperscaler managed um, virtual machine layer uh, on top of a public cloud, we're actually the first time looking into giving away um, more, um, let's say, responsibility or more control over the entire um, stack than we may uh, want to do in the beginning. This is why we'll start very slowly and this is why we want to get comfortable with it step by step. But um, uh, what I want to say is that the, the, uh, the less we have control of the hardware from a, from a telecoms perspective and from the, let's say, um, from the minds that are still driving telecoms, to say it like this, um, this is very important. Um, and uh, we're still just talking virtual machines, uh, but already see when it comes to putting them in hyperscalers, we're feeling a bit uncomfortable. Um, and that means with, with containers, we have again um, the, the problem, right? Once we put containers there, we have again a different level of abstraction. We can, of course, own the hardware. We, we can have the hardware owned by somebody else. We can use a platform 
For Kubernetes, the same thing. We can use a managed Kubernetes. We can set it up ourselves. But step by step, um, coming from that virtualization layer, putting on a resource that we actually own, we're losing more and more control over the layer. And only in the end then comes serverless, right? Um, and I think this, this slowly fading touch of hardware that starts somewhat on the hyperscaler side and then fades more and more um, is something that um, kind of touches a fundamental heart of how networks were planned, of how software was um, put in uh, networks, and also of how planning, concrete planning, has been done um, for a long time. Because for a long time, when it comes to using um, any type of scalable infrastructure, um, I think carriers will focus always rather on the hardware. Uh, by that, I mean features to get dedicated resources, CPU pinning or dedicated I.O. Um, attachments, then relying on scalability and solving actually the issues in software. The same is with redundancy. I've seen a lot of projects, um, and I don't exclude ours here, that rather go for um, for a redundancy approach you would have done in, uh, let's say, four more times, where you say you have a certain redundancy, you can completely fail uh, on a site, um, and the other side has the cap capacity basically ready, rather than um, provisioning it in a way that you uh, require to be, are required to scale up um, in case of a hardware failure and um, be a bit more, uh, again, relying on the software layer, on the programmable layer of your infrastructure. Uh, and I think um, only once that all is really sorted uh, and we are confident and have maybe even uh, a multi-year experience again and multi-years of standardization again, I think only then we'll see classic anti-workloads. Um, and by that, I mean stuff with the anti-legacy, um, anti-protocols and definitions in mind, move to containers, right? Um, and, even, and then again, once um, we've regained confidence and so on, then eventually it may move to container orchestration and so on, and eventually to serverless, if we don't um, rethink telecoms. Um, before coming to that rethinking telecoms aspect, I want to look at, um, at another point about provisioning. Um, um, I already touched it shortly. Um, what I see is that the um, even though we use more scalable um, infrastructure, and even though we um, have the possibilities of also um, kind of programming this um, infrastructure layer of interacting with it programmatically and of acting on uh, events from the system, we do not really s provision it uh, in a different way than we used to, right? Um, I still see over-provisioning uh, like in the good old days. Capacity is being there but unused. Um, uh, first step could be to um, to get there, to get to something like serverless, which is really flexible, and we really have no idea how many servers are now powering this, is to go um, from the um, over-provisioning, as I mentioned, to provisioning statically uh, for a certain baseline um, with uh, planned peak coverage and the manually increase then. So for example, imagine you have a curve going here, you have a baseline that's always served, and when you know, um, I don't know, on this particular day you get a higher load, or in night times you have a lower load and for daytimes you have a higher load, you just pre-provision capacity um, and deprovision it um, afterwards, all right? Can be done manually, that would already be a step ahead and when a system fails, you can theoretically also do that. Um, the next evolution step could be then to provision um, statically for a certain baseline with static um, or dynamic um, adaptation on peak coverage, right? So that you actually say, well, um, we provision statically, but we keep monitoring the utilization. And once there is a higher um, utilization detected or a certain threshold is reached, then we are provisioning more. Uh, and once we see for a while this um, um, capacity that we provision no longer used, then we would deprovision it again. And only then comes auto scaling, where we really say, well, we provision a certain uh, workload for the minimum that we always need. And everything on top of that will be scaled when required um, and uh, scaled up, scaled down, completely dynamic. I think um, until here, um, we had a clear understanding of the infrastructure. We were still thinking in infrastructure capacity. And only now we are again relying on the software layer to take care of it. And this process, I think, is a very important one to learn in telecoms. It has also nothing really to do with standardization or with, with all the um, VNFI and NFVI and, and whatever um, whatever um, acronyms were thrown in the discussion from a telco, let's say, um, perspective under the virtualization world, it's something that you need to um, become aware of. And I think once we're there, 
the other steps again moving to containers and so on the serverless eventually um, may become easier and then also other things may become easier so for example testing We're doing a lot of testing these days um, vendors test a lot they commit on their infrastructure being capable to run a certain load um, on a certain hardware configuration and so on um, and i think before we can get um, far out <laughs> with whatever we'll have on the serverless function. I don't mean here even the cost aspect, if we would let it run you know, forever or how much this would cost, or, or I really mean um, really letting go completely um, of the hardware. I think again, it's something, uh, a question in, in, in the mind of many carriers that we need to understand what the software actually does. Um, and that knowledge is simply not widely available in the telco world just yet, at least not for the classic communication stacks um, we put into our networks because we're not building them ourselves, vendors are building those, right? Um, a last aspect, I touched it shortly, is the financial planning. It's again a, a very complex thing uh, and if you do anything else than bare metal servers, you have a very hard time in getting this um, through, your, through your budget, um, at least when you want to really provision it per utilization or when you don't know really the forecast or when you say, well, I might need this, I might need that. Um, it's not trivial, especially um, when it comes to bigger projects. So when I again look at my experience now, uh, what I need to do or what we need to do um, is a planning of uh, financial planning of a multi-year project. We need to plan the infrastructure resources per year. Um, and it's much easier, as I said, to just purchase a bunch of servers, even though they're not fully utilized, than to plan and operate a stack um, at its optimal level of utilization, right? Because the processes aren't really um, aren't really there yet. Um, so summarizing this this short outlook into why I think um, I guess as a, as one of the conclusions, serverless is still very far um, out for um, for telcos. Is that there's there's lots to learn um, for um, for us. Uh, so that classic workload um, again can be run on serverless components, whether it's suitable or not. But our our mind um, needs to change in a way. I think what can help is looking at um, utilizing hyperscalers and utilizing really um, infrastructure that we do not need to pay for in advance, um, at least uh, to a certain amount. Of course, there you would also commit to resources, but still um, you have a certain kind of higher flexibility than building, um, building this all yourself. Um, and we can learn with them because they have execution environments for serverless functions. They are um, rather cheap to execute. So it's something really nice to learn. Um, and um, I think a lot of the learning will go into um, somehow overcoming the classic NT complexity style um, virtualization, doing things a bit more um, like, um, like the IT does it. And I guess what I hope is also that those getting involved into programmability of core communication stacks are also orienting themselves more um, on the IT world rather than the NT world. There are a few in the carrier world that are doing containers already, which I very much uh, like. And I think it's a very good thing that it's done in small teams and hands on um, in DT as a small team uh, building a platform called Dust Shift. You'll find also stuff on uh, on YouTube about that. Um, it's, it's very interesting. It's again to learn. Um, but um, yeah, neither have I seen this going beyond Kubernetes. So there are no frameworks such as Fison being used or anything else where you would say you have a, a layer you build yourself to put um, serverless um, workloads to. A last sort of um, outline or thought that I wanted to throw into the discussion is that I think really um, a completely different approach to how we build services could help us also to utilize um, certain advances we've made now in the IT world and maybe even to um, like jump some generations um, and move right away to a very modern IT framework with a very modern anti-framework, but I think this can only be done if you really think of something that doesn't have any legacy constraints attached. Um, it could be some entirely new event different communication stack um, replacing the telco core as we know it. And what I don't mean is really a one-on-one -on -one legacy um, telco protocols and implementations mapping. Uh, we could of course do that, right? We could analyze listeners um, running 24 seven and every SIP message uh, calls a Lambda function puts it into context, checks the text, whatever in dialogue, out of dialogue, triggers HSR, or HSS lookups and so on. But I don't really think um, that's efficient. Maybe there's also something we can debate. I just think um, the right part, the right point here 
to start is not really um, serverless, but really the service you're actually trying to build there. And does it make sense? Um, and on the other hand, it may also not be really efficient without our vendors following. Um, and I think the whole NT industry and their focus on standardization um, just won't go there. Um, so uh, what I'd like more to think about is the question, if we were to fully rebuild the communication stack, um, if I would be asked to do that for DT, let's say, I wouldn't really look into containers or Kubernetes first or how we can um, virtualize it the best or run it the most efficient our hardware uh, and scale it the most efficiently. But what I'd really look at is um, what we want to offer to our customers and how our future communication stack actually would look like. Right. Um, and with performance optimizations in our LT and 5G networks, um, with performant voice and video encoders in the end devices, um, and those decoders also becoming uh, accessible to the software layer, why not combine this and create a completely new stack that's event-driven, can be maybe an evolution of CPaaS in a way, um, and that can then be served by serverless functions. Um, so we don't start at what can we do now to make it serverless, but we may end there with a completely different um, different approach. Uh, and we would still combine um, software features with network features. It's a bit like LTE really, because LTE is nothing else than a specialized app on the phone um, that is harmonized over carriers and over OEMs uh, and that makes use of LTE prioritization features, right? And this is something our stack um, could also do. Um, it's not driven by serverless. Um, uh, it's not like like for in, the, in, the, in the concept, it's not to run the same old, same old NT stacks. Um, um, and so on and follow the advances of the IT world, but really um, redefine it um, and then throw on it all our IT know-how and have in the end a better communications product with more focus um, on the customer. And, and I think that's an, um, that's an option that I find very interesting um, and where serverless is kind of not really uh, the core of it. We could build it differently, um, but it's one of the, um, one of the things um, that I think uh, can make sense when it comes to radically um, rebuilding something to uh, perform more efficiently. Because I think when we um, think of something like this, uh, we can become on one hand more independent um, from each other. We don't need to align on everything. When we evolve 4G telephony to 5G telephony, um, again, there's a lot of work put into it, but in the end, it's just telephony. The phone is just making a call. Um, and um, we can really do that in a different way where we will not have to give up uh, on our customers and on the potential of interworking between carriers, uh, but we rather move um, the interworking from an all standardized stack of the network edge to the end device stacks, right? With protocol handlers, for example, being exchanged and only this part being aligned, um, intercarrier traffic can go through the user's hands. Um, so if I'm with DT, you're with Vodafone um, and I call you, um, we don't need to align our applications, uh, but I, when I'm inviting you, give you the destination, you have to query for obtaining the DT stack, um, then you can do that. And then it uses your um, uh, yeah, EVS decoder and the phone to make a call through my DT platform with me. Um, both LTE networks or 5G networks provide quality of service and we have a very high quality, um, whatever, communication session. I don't want to name it a call. And when you would call me, we could do this um, vice versa. And in this process, uh, we could use, um, let's say, modern web technologies even, or we could use SIP, but uh, more importantly, we could rebuild it um, so it fits into the 2020s um, um, technology knowledge and platforms we have. And um, yeah, and then in the end, I think um, this is something where I think we should start um, uh, thinking of the technology and maybe ending up with serverless or saying at some point, hey, what's the best way of doing this and come out of serverless, but not start off serverless and telecoms um, by moving um, SIP servers in the cloud, right? Um, yeah, and um, so that was a short kind of, uh, or maybe not that short, but, but nevertheless, um, um, exploration um, of what I think of advances, technological advances in telecoms, NTIT world, I've discussed it also earlier, um, to name a few points from the panel, what I'm interested in actually is, of course, what others think. So do you actually think we will see SIGTRAN or SIP serverless functions? Um, do you already run containers for voice over IP workloads, for example? Um, uh, are you looking forward to the benefits of serverless for that? What are these for you? Is actually containerization a challenge you've already overcome um, or not? Maybe that's a kind of shout out also to working group two. Um, I know they develop a very modern telecom stack. Um, are they, are you guys using 
these kind of functionalities. Maybe this is something worth discussing um, at TED Summit. Um, what's your thoughts on a more event-driven, more modern carrier core communication stack? Um, and last but not least, maybe also to think about and discuss who provides the platforms for these kinds of serverless things um, in the future. Do we again start to reinvent the wheels as we did for um, virtualization or will we finally um, partner and focus on the service and the experience um, our customers will have in the end? That's it. I'm looking very much forward to the panel discussion with you all.